Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julian Borgia. I'm uh, the diplomatic editor on the, the Guardian. It's been a very long time since I was on the front line of any description, so it's uh, good to be back even precariously. I'm here just to uh, in introduce Clive, uh, who has had an extraordinary career, who's given I, I hope we agreed to, you know, spare the sincerity. We've got to keep this short and, you know, <laughs> and insincere. Yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> no, the description of your career is going to be <laughs> Very brief. Uh, um, he's spent his life opposing uh, the death penalty in the U.S. and around the world, and uh, more recently opposing in internment without trial in Guantanamo. Uh, and he's gone about it the practical way, uh, in based in New Orleans for the best part of 20 years. Uh, he uh, gave his legal services and provided investigative services for uh, poor convicts not able to. Uh, on death row, not able to uh, establish their instance. Um, and um, more recently came back to Britain in 2004 uh, and has kept up that struggle against uh, capital punishment in the US through the organization Reprieve, which he founded. Uh, and as far as Guantanamo is concerned, he's represented, what, 60 or so oh, that's of the inmates, mm -hmm. past and present. You've got to sink to some personal insults very soon, Julian. And it's coming. Yeah, yeah, it's it. um, <laughs> uh, including Wazambeg, and uh, of the five British residents, do you yeah, represent them all of them? Yeah. Um, there are actually eight, it's just the British government doesn't recognize three of them. <laughs> and are you pushing for the... Uh, I came from the Foreign Office oh. to the front line club. <laughs> so yes, from a from a you know something of a victory, this uh, you know a complete policy mm -hmm. U-turn on Guantanamo, and uh, and when it comes to the death penalty as well, another success in recent days with the overturning of the conviction of, of Kenny Ritchie, a Briton mm -hmm. who was on death row for 20 years or so mm -hmm. in the states, uh, and he's written a book about Guantanamo, Bad Men, uh, Guantanamo, and the Secret Prisons. I don't know if it's available in the foyer, but. I've got copies. I'll flog to you cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and of course uh, awarded the OBE. Uh, in now we're getting fancy. Which I'm not that makes you a knight. No, no, uh, that was from my mum. My mum got to go me. <laughs> <laughs> so may, uh, maybe not a knight, but but a, you know a real gent and one of the few genuine heroes. Uh, and and full disclosure, Clive once offered to marry me. <laughs> no, I don't remember that, but it's probably not in the sense of matrimony. No, but he, you offered to <laughs> you offered to conduct the service <laughs> in a, a Louisiana jail cell. Oh, right, that's true. <laughs> and we we opted for Melbourne in the end. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, um, do you want to say a few words? Oh, can I just no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. But we should say that I am in favour of people interrupting at any given moment, rather than the bank. There are two things we need to do tonight <laughs> in violation of their rules, because whenever anyone has rules, we should violate them. <laughs> and one is that I, I favor people interrupting immediately at any time, just put, you know, just throw something. And the second is they said I wasn't allowed to pass around a sign-up sheet to make you all <laughs> volunteer to work with us, so we're certainly going to do that. The doors are now locked, and until you swear in blood how you're going to help us, um, you know, with all of this, you're not leaving. Um, you, of course, you don't have to do anything, but it'd be nice if you did. We'd really like your help. So I'll, I'll send that around just in, because I was told I couldn't, we'll pass it around. <laughs> right now. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Well, why not start by, I mean, you were a lawyer for inmates in Guantanamo. In what ways is that different from being a defense lawyer for a prisoner but, anywhere you know, else? It's, it, it's interesting that I was a Soros fellow for a while, George Soros, who, well, you know, having wrecked the economies of most, uh, most countries over here, has subsequently done really wonderful things. And, and he calls his uh, charity uh, the, the Open Society. And I'd never really figured out what that meant until you start seeing the difference between an open society. Is there a way to turn this down because it's sort of echoing back and forward? The, an open society versus a closed society. And you know, when you're representing someone on death row, there, there are all sorts of factors that, uh, that you see. Uh, that play into the incredible number of innocent people on death row. I hate representing innocent people, I really do. And there's, there's a lot of pressure. And yet, as the years have gone by, there have been more and more innocent people on death row as the process got politicized. And you see certain things, such as snitches, for example, a huge factor in 
why people end up on death row for the wrong thing. And then various prejudices about black people and also that the structure is to prevent anyone from recognizing that the emperor wears no clothes. So every death row in America is miles away from anywhere. So no one can go up there. And you know, the three, how many people are American here? Put your hands up. Oh, right, I'm American too. We are the human beings in the room, the rest of the subhuman beings. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that later. But, but you know, one of the fascinating things about um, the Supreme Court is they're clueless. And over the last uh, 25 years, I'd be interested, one of you Americans, if you could identify for me um, what your opinion is the stupidest American Supreme Court decision in the last 25 years. But surely <laughs> right up there, one of them is that if you're on death row, you have no right to a lawyer. That in the richest country in the world, if you're mentally disabled and uh, juvenile, you're meant to represent yourself. That, that's actually number two on my hierarchy <laughs> of really stupid decisions. And all of this process is set up to make sure that you can't prove, oh, well, like number one, by the way, is Herrera versus Collins, which holds that under the US Constitution, if you're innocent of the crime, that's not relevant to whether you should be executed. That's the law. That is the law in the United States. And the reason for that is that nowhere in the US Constitution does it say thou shalt not execute an innocent person. Um, and you know, that's because it doesn't say in the Constitution that the sun rises either. But um, when you look at all of that, the, the whole thing is structured so you can't see how many mistakes there, there are. When you translate that to a closed society, to Guantanamo Bay, instead of the prison being in bumfuck Louisiana, Angola it's called, um, <laughs> it's, in, it's in Guantanamo Bay, it's, where, it's in Cuba, where no one can go there. And instead of it being that you're allowed a lawyer who can't really do anything because Gonzalez wants to expedite your execution and you can't claim innocence, you don't get a lawyer. And instead of having a prosecutor, or persecutor as we call them, who is elected to prosecute and has those prejudices that come with that, you've got a military prosecutor who's been hand-picked by the Bush administration and anyone who had any liberal leanings wasn't allowed to do it. They had a process where you had to go through uh, the, this vetting thing. So when you're in Guantanamo Bay, everything that happened in that open society that led to so many mistakes is exponentially doubled. And when you come to the issue of, uh, of how people end up there, you know, you've got snitches there too. And, uh, you know, one of the things, I've got all these, these fantastic bits of paper where the United States government dropped leaflets offering $5,000 for any foreign Taliban who people in Pakistan and Afghanistan would like to turn in. Um, $5,000 in those parts of the world translates roughly on GDP to a quarter of a million dollars here in Britain. And I, and I always ask this because I, and I know you're here, this chap over here was here last night at something I was doing and his wife said she would turn him in for a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> uh, but I ask you, I ask you to look to the person to your right and, and, and then put your hand up if you would be willing to <laughs> snitch on him for a quarter of a million dollars. And, uh, you know, but all you've got to do, you don't have to actually do anything except tell me that the person to your right was in Tora Bora in September 2001. Come on, how much? She was, she was there. She was there. It's your chance to get your own back. You can say that about this woman next year. So the, the problem in all seriousness, of course, is that when you offer those sorts of monies, people come forward, they, they don't like these Arabs anyhow, what are they doing in Pakistan? And so they snitch on them, turn them in. I am now the American interrogator, and I've been authorized by uh, Donald Rumsfeld certifiable lunatic that he is, to apply uh, enhanced interrogation techniques on you. So I'm going to start trying to interrogate you as to whether you were in Tora Bora in September, October 2001. So we begin, madam, with a few enhanced interrogation techniques where I threaten you with what we used to call... Well, no, we don't torture people. We use enhanced interrogation <laughs> techniques. And one of them we're going to use used to be termed by the um, Spanish Inquisition, uh, strapado. And we're going to hang you up by your thing. We're going to hang you behind. That's reverse strapado. Dislocate your shoulders. And as we do that, I'm going to ask you, were you in Tora Bora in October 2001? Were you? Of course she was, yeah. <laughs> now, when I've done that, I'm not torturing her because I think she's innocent. I think she's guilty because this woman told me she was. 
And now she just bought herself a ticket to Guantanamo Bay where there are no defense lawyers. And it, again, when you get to Guantanamo, they're not a bunch of psychopaths. They're people who really believe they're defending America in the war on terror. And they have reliable information from this lady, corroborated by my interrogation of her where she's confessed that she was in Tora Bora, and she's an enemy combatant. And that's it. Now, the problem is, when I went to Guantanamo, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to have some explaining to do what these guys were doing in Afghanistan. Now, five and a half years later, we have the U.S. government's official figures. Ninety-five percent, according to their own figures, were not captured by the United States at all, even though they said they were. Fifty-five percent by their own figures weren't in Afghanistan when they were seized by someone else. And they're wrong on a bunch of the other 45 percent, too. So they're wrong so often. And then we get to the, the real cases. It's, it's, it's not clear whether you should laugh or cry. To answer your question in a very long, rounded way, um, when I first went there, um, which was in November 2004, to see Mozambique, they have a thing which I don't like to compare to what they had over the Nazi death camps, but they had, because um, it's pejorative, you understand. But it says, honor bound to defend freedom on over the gate of Guantanamo Bay, as opposed to our bite marked whatever it was. Uh, you know, what was it? Fry. 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 Yeah, work makes you free or something like that. Anyway, you know, this is a ridiculous thing, honor bound to defend freedom when you're locking people up with any rights and they don't have any freedom. But we were outside the McDonald's uh, on one of the first days I was there, and the soldiers are required to salute each other. I didn't know this, you know. We're outside McDonald's. One salutes the other and says, honor bound, sir. And the other salutes back and says, to defend freedom, soldier. <laughs> and you will forgive me if I say I laughed. I thought this was a joke. <laughs> and so I laughed. And they didn't take that well. And uh, it turns <laughs> out... Postmodern irony. Yeah, they take it very seriously. And, you know, this is just a very strange, strange world that's compounded by some very strange people who, who keep telling you that it's a holiday camp. Uh, how do they, you said there are no defense lawyers, obviously, but you were eventually there. How does an inmate in Guantanamo Bay get to see you? Well, um, we sued uh, on February the 19th, 2002. When I say we, it was me and a couple of mates in America. Um, because, you know, when I heard about Guantanamo, it just pissed me off. And uh, I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is the ultimate hypocrisy, isn't it? That we say we're fighting a war to protect freedom and the rule of law. And the first thing we do is establish a prison in Cuba, which we've said for 48 years doesn't have the rule of law. And we hold them there without giving them the rule of law. And, by the way, if you're an animal in Cuba, you have legal rights because you have the environmental laws. So if you're an iguana, <laughs> you have rights. Whereas if you're not an American, put your hands up, Americans, again. <laughs> We're all right. You and I are right. But she's not. But she's a damn foreigner. And you, you, you foreigners have no legal rights. We argued in the U.S. Supreme Court, and I was rather proud when Justice Stevens asked a question on this. We argued equal rights for iguanas. Um, that we thought that <laughs> iguanas and British people, if they had equal rights, would be a big step forward for you. <laughs> um, but we lost. And, and it was really hostile back then. I mean, it really was. I, I made a big mistake of, uh, many of you may be aficionados of Fox television. I will confess I'd never watched it. <laughs> and so when we sued, I was invited to go on Fox television. I thought, well, fun, yeah, I'll go and do that. <laughs> and one of those lunatics um, accused me of being a traitor 13 times and tried to get me to confess I was a traitor. It was not, it was not nice. And we got these fantastic hate messages on my home answering machine at 3 o'clock in the morning the next day. And um, it was really hostile back then. Uh, but I was very surprised, and, and this illustrated my misjudgment. I thought everyone would want to sue George Bush. Um, who wouldn't? And, uh, and yet it was really hard, because everything was so raw after 9-11. Because what you've got to understand is America's only been invaded territorially three times in, the la in its whole history. What were those? By the way? 1812. Who did that? Us? What did we do? Why is the we White House? <laughs> Why is the White House white? It used to be grey until the Brits burned it, and then they had to do it white. And, you know, it really hasn't happened a lot to the U.S. Right? It happened. Uh, you know, Pearl Harbor wasn't even American territory, American um, mainland, and then 9/11. So the Americans have not suffered this sort of thing, and it, it was a huge shock. And you know, you've got to sympathise with that. That 9/11 was an unbelievably shocking crime. 
And so they reacted, as, as often societies do, in an unbelievably stupid way. But it took us two and a half years of losing in the courts before finally, in June 2004, the US Supreme Court said that habeas corpus applied to the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay in Rasul versus Bush. Um, so then, for the first time, we were allowed to go visit prisoners, but really difficult. You know, I can't say, hey, there's you know, 753 prisoners in Guantanamo. I want to represent them. I'm a do-gooder. And, um, you know, I just want to do it. I'm not going to make them pay. I just want to do it. You can't do that as a lawyer. You have to have their permission to do it. So I said to our colleagues at the Department of Defense, how about letting us come down and talk to them? and ask them if they want to lure it. No, you can't do that. That's a security threat. <laughs> so what we had to do, this was bizarre. We had to get next friends. You had to get family members of prisoners to give you authorization to represent them. I spent months traveling around all these Middle Eastern countries, first apologizing. Because let's face it, because I'm British and American and my wife's Australian, I can apologize for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I would, I would say, look, we want to represent your family members and, uh, you know, we'll do this. And yeah, it wasn't easy. It really wasn't. I got taken in by the secret police in, uh, in Jordan, which is fun talking about it now, but <laughs> terrifying then. Yeah, they took me into this place. The guy who tortured al Zakawi, it was, it turned out. I got taken into this place in, uh, in Amman. And um, going to this old, down these long passageways with dark doors off to the side. And up till then, I'd just been annoyed because I was working and this bastard had interrupted me. But then I started getting quite intimidated. Go into this room, there are these two guys. And I say, hi, I'm Clive Stafford Smith. Who are you? And one of them says, we do not use names in this building. <laughs> so I filled out my passport. I said, I do. And my, my embassy is going to be calling you in, the next, in an hour if I'm not out of here, which was a total fib. <laughs> um, and so we had this long conversation, got a bit hostile. And I said, I'm going to take down your description and find out who you are, sir. And um, anyway, finally, I got out of there. And it turned out I described him to some lawyer in Amman. And it was the guy who tortured al Zakawi guy called Kenny, Colonel Ali Burjak. But it was really quite difficult to track down all these families all around the Middle East to get their permission to represent their loved ones in Guantanamo Bay. And that took ages. And finally, you know, uh, from many, many trips around there, we got about 60 prisoners' families authorizations so we could then go down and represent them. And then the, the Americans then, the American military, I never liked, the Americans, the American people, my clients in Guantanamo Bay say, we got nothing against the American people. They got something against George Bush, and we don't want to mix those two. The American military then sent a little note round saying to all the prisoners, if you want habeas corpus, which they didn't explain, it's a Latin term, <laughs> then all you've got to do is get a friend to do it for you or a family member. So that gave me the bright idea that I could just get all the other prisoners who I went to see. I got Mosenbeck to sign authorizations for all the other guys. But you've got to remember, again, we didn't know who they were. There were 700 guys in there. They wouldn't tell us who the prisoners were in Guantanamo. So it's an enormous job to just try and figure out who the prisoners are. Um, and then, but I got my clients to sign authorizations saying that they were friends with these other guys and that these other guys wanted lawyers. And that, that worked for a while. It was a great way to get lawyers in. Then they got wise to that, and they now challenge it. And they now say that even though they sent the thing around saying any friend can represent you, that's not people in Guantanamo. So they now challenge it. And even today, there are 365 prisoners in Guantanamo. We have managed to get lawyers in to almost two-thirds. But a third of them, five and a half years later, including two British residents, have never seen a lawyer. And it's been an enormous battle. Oh, can I just tell one other story before we get to the next question? Because every time they do that, they try and undermine you, too. It, it makes you laugh, except it's actually very devious. Um, the, the interrogators, the moment we got the right to counsel, the interrogators started going in saying they were the lawyers. And they're, they're, we're here to help. We're, here, we're lawyers here to help. Now tell us, are you a terrorist? And so then we got in finally as lawyers. And you have to be an American national to get in. So we're forced to go in and say, hi, I'm American. I'm here to help you. Um, and then the interrogators who are interrogating them in between our meetings, about our meetings with our clients, start trying to sow discord between us and the prisoners. So I go in to see Shakarama one day, one of the British residents. 
And Shaka says, you're Jewish, aren't you? <laughs> and I say, well, you know, actually, that's interesting you bring that up. Um, but I was 37 before my father said he was Jewish. I didn't know that. And I said, Shaka, how did you know? <laughs> I, mean, you know I didn't know that until we had a long conversation. And he said that his, um, that his interrogator had said I was Jewish because we Zionists are evil people and you can't trust us. And Shaka and I agreed that actually we're all Semites and it's those fucking Anglos you've got to worry about. <laughs> um, but then the next visit, I'm going to see a guy called Osama Abu Kabir from Jordan. He's a nice guy, but a bit conservative. You know, <laughs> up in a, and, and he says they're saying something about your tribe, and I say, what is it, what is it? And I'm all excited at this point. And he gets red in the face and says, I, I, I can't tell you. No, oh, please, please, tell me, what is it they're saying? No, oh, no, no, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> and so finally, um, I say, please, Osama, please tell me. He says, they're saying that you like to have sex with men. <laughs> God. And it's all this bullshit that, you know, I had to deny that because you can't get into a big debate. Osama is actually a bit homophobic because of where he came <laughs> up from. And I had to say, oh, my wife, you know, whatever. But, um, but, you know, it's not a place for a big debate about the, the mores of sexuality. But, you know, this, when it, it was funny. I thought it was funny, but it's also horrendous, right? That these interrogators are trying to get the prisoners not to trust us as lawyers by saying these things. And it's very, very difficult to get a guy who's been tortured for five years to trust you. It's very difficult to get him to trust his own mother, quite frankly, but to get him to trust an American who comes in and says, I'm here to help you, but by the way, the courts are fucking worthless and they'll never get you out of here. And we've been litigating for five and a half years and so far the courts have ordered the, the release of zero prisoners and that actually people who are released are released through the court of public opinion, not through the court of law. Um, it's very hard to get people to say, well, oh, all right, when I'm going to work with you, I won't use my lawyer. It's very difficult, and it's a, it's a different world from, that's a rather long answer to your question. It is. It's very different. Mm. But, uh, and when you were talking to your clients there, are uh, you in private? And when you leave, how limited are you about what you can take out information uh, mm. you learn and bring to the outside world? The, they have this um, tour for us when we go and and for media they have a media familiarization tour which i once made the big mistake of calling a propaganda tour and got dressed down by the camera <laughs> um, but they take you around as you get there and they show you a cell and they show you the comfort items that the prisoners have <laughs> and which include the orange uniform it includes a bar of soap and it includes a little toothbrush that you put on your finger and rub your thing and the thing that it really included which amused me was it includes a game of checkers now, these guys are in solitary confinement. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my natural response to the soldier doing this was, who's he going to play with? And you know, he sort of smiled and said, oh, I don't know. So said, You're not allowed to play with you, right? That would be a violation of security. Oh, no, I couldn't play with him, sir. Um, so he's meant to play with himself at checkers, is he? Yeah, I guess so. And, you know, there's this bizarre thing. And they take you around on this tour, and then they take you into the cell, and they point out the, the camera that's going to be watching you all the time, and they say, but we've set it up so we can't uh, read your lips and stuff. But no one listens to anything you say. This is totally confidential. And you know, there are some lawyers who went in and said to their clients, this is totally confidential, anything we talk about in there. And the, the client said, you've got to be kidding me. And that was the last they ever trusted those lawyers. Because you know, when you want assistance in those cells from the guards, if you want to leave, if you want to go to the toilet, it's, you know, you have to ask permission. Um, you press a button, they answer, and then you talk into it without holding the button and they can listen to you. So they can hear you, right? Mm. And anyone who believes that they're not listening in believes in Santa Claus. And I say to my clients that, and I say I do believe in Santa Claus, <laughs> but you've still got to be very naive to believe that people aren't listening in and we should approach our conversations as if everything is being taped, because I'm sure it is. Um, so that's really that way. But, you know, the other aspect is the censorship. Every single word. I've got in my bag here, Samuel Haj, my Al Jazeera client. You know, he's an Al Jazeera journalist. How many people here are journalists of some sort? Well, you bastards need to help pour, out and pour Samuel Haj out. You haven't done nearly enough yet. And you're going to sign that thing in blood, you people. Um, Samuel Haj is an Al Jazeera journalist who has suffered from the prejudice of working for Al Jazeera 
because people don't speak Arabic. So that I think it's great, you know. And if you have to balance Al Jazeera against Fox Television, you know, who's going to hold their hand up saying Fox Television is more objective? Put your hand up, please. <laughs> anyway, Sammy, I've got stuff in here that is for official use only that you people can't, can't know. Um, and more, about 75% of my last visit to Samuel Hajj, I'm not allowed to talk about publicly. And then there's the stuff that's classified. And every single word that I'm allowed to say to you or that I write in uh, that uh, not terribly erudite book it has been through the census. I had to put that book through the military census. Uh, every single word. And, you know, this was the way it worked. It was very bizarre in the early days. When I first went to see Mozambique, just to illustrate it, I should say this. It's fun, the censorship stuff. The greatest legal philosopher known to humankind is Brewer Rabbit. Um, <laughs> because when they cover stuff up, it's just so much fun. But when I first went to see Mozambique, I sat down with him for three days, and he described to me how he'd been tortured. And I wrote all my notes. I'm not allowed to take my notes out of Guantanamo Bay. I have to give them to the military in a sealed envelope that says secret over it. And uh, then they're sent to a secure, secret facility somewhere in the vicinity of Washington, D.C. If I tell you where it is, I have to shoot you. Where I'm allowed then to go read my notes in this secret facility. I'm not allowed to say a word about what my client said until they've unclassified it. So when I did this with Mozambique back in 2004, um, I wrote up a 30-page memo about how he'd been tortured. Every single word was classified. I wasn't allowed to talk about it at all. And I went to talk to the nice FBI agent there who was doing it. And he was very apologetic. And he, I said, why? You know, why, why is this classified? And he says, well, it's because this is the methods and means of interrogation. You, what you call torture. No, no, that is the methods and means of interrogation. And when we said we were raping his wife in the room next door, that was a means of interrogation. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, shit, you know, how am I going to get this stuff out? And so it struck me. It was actually tremendous fun. I, I thought, all right, I'm going to write to Tony Blair. Um, so I wrote a letter to Tony, and there's dear prime minister. And at the top it said, in Ray, torture of British citizens by your mates, the Americans. And then it detailed everything that happened to Mozambique. And in the very last sentence it said, anything that's been X'd out of this letter and censored has been censored by your friends, the Americans. Um, you're sincerely Clive. So, of course, they censored everything, except the first thing at the top saying what it was about and the last sentence <laughs> at the bottom saying that it was censored. So we published that here in Britain in the newspapers, and it was really embarrassing because it looked really, it's great, it looks great. It's all blacked out for pages and pages except for this thing in the bottom. So that really embarrassed them, and we gradually used those sorts of tactics to make them look stupid. And so they changed the rules, and they eventually changed the rules so actually torture was no longer classified as a method and means of interrogation, and we could get it out. And every word that you know about, about uh, abuses of prisoners in Guantanamo has come out through that process. Um, but it's a long struggle, and now they're retrenching. You know, we won that battle for a long time. The FBI agents, to their credit, were really nice, the ones I would deal with, and they sympathized. They just were following these rules, and we would work with them to change the rules. Um, but now, because they're desperate, they've changed the rules again. And they're now, they've now introduced this new system, which is called FOUO, for official use only, where they can say to you, it's not classified, but they say to us, you're not allowed to tell those bastard journalists, because that might get out of hand. So now, anything, for example, almost anything about hunger strikes, for example, in Guantanamo, because they say that's not legitimate legal discussion, we're not allowed to talk about publicly. Um, now, I've got a little strategy to get around that too, actually, which uh, we will put into use tomorrow, but, which is legal, I should say, for the people tape recording this in uh, Washington, <laughs> D.C. Totally legal. But it's just a constant battle to get any fact about Guantanamo out. And censorship is the name of the game, and it's, well, except I call it actually lies, damned lies, and semantics, because they use these semantic definitions to, to change the name of the game in, in many, many ways to stop the truth coming out in, in ways that are shocking. Uh, let's open it up. Uh, Can I just tell you about a couple of the ways they do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, John Minnell. Many of you know John. Works for Radio 4 Today program. Uh, January 24th, 2004, in interviewed a woman called Lieutenant Commander Burfiend. And John said, um, are there any juveniles in Guantanamo Bay? And Lieutenant Commander Burfiend said, no, there are no juveniles in Guantanamo Bay. And John said, do you plan ever to hold juveniles? And she said, no, we don't plan to hold juveniles in Guantanamo. I was a bit surprised because I was representing a kid who was 14 at the time <laughs> that he was seized, a guy called uh, Mohammed El Garani, goes by the name Yusuf. Actually, and then also, uh, you know, Omar Kadar, the Canadian, 15 at the time that he was seized too. And in the end, we worked out there were 64 juveniles in Guantanamo Bay under the commonly accepted definition of juvenile, um, which is that you're under 18 at the time you commit whatever offense you're alleged to have committed. And that's commonly accepted by the UN, by the US Supreme Court, by everybody. So what was it that, someone tell me, uh, you're the interrogator, you're the American interrogator, how could it be that Lieutenant Commander Burfin could look at John Minnell and say, on Radio 4, there are no juveniles in Guantanamo Bay? How, how, did, she do that? how did she do it? No, I, I suspect she knew all about it. Mm. Well, they were legally juveniles when the question was asked, but you're getting warm. She classified juveniles as under 16. Well, yeah, you're, you're a CIA agent, obviously. <laughs> he's got his thing on. He, not just that, they classified juveniles as under 16 today. So if I grab your small child at age three and hold that child for long enough, they're not juvenile anymore, so I can do what I like with them. And they, the military really just simply redefined the term juvenile so they could look you in the eye and tell you that there are no juveniles. They, all, they did all sorts of other things. Um, Samuel Lathy, an Egyptian I was representing, was cleared in his combatant status review tribunal um, of being an enemy combatant. And he was a NEC. I mean, I love this stuff. You know, they have these great acronyms, not an enemy combatant. And they didn't tell me. In fact, they waited until the day after I left seeing Sammy to tell him, so he wouldn't tell me. I didn't find it out for two months. When I did find it out, I naturally suggested he should perhaps be released because he was innocent. And I filed a, a, you know, a mandamus motion in the American courts. They replied by saying, oh, I'm sorry, counsel misunderstands. No, 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 it's not NEC, it's NLEC. Uh, he's no longer an enemy combatant. And they simply changed the rules. I mean, the Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England, had said to you people, journalists, that uh, the CSRT is an up or down decision. If you're an enemy combatant, you're an enemy. If you're not, you go free. Well, then, just a few months later, when it became inconvenient, they simply changed it, and they called them NLECs. Yeah, he was a bad guy before, but, you know, he's learned how it is to be a, a nice, you know, person in favor of liberty and freedom, and now he's an NLEC. And this goes on and on and on. It's like intensive assisted feeding. There is no forced feeding in Guantanamo Bay because it's called intensive assisted feeding. Uh, it's like there's no torture in Guantanamo Bay because that's called enhanced interrogation techniques. It just goes on and on and on, and you're living in this bizarre twilight world where people say that to you all the time. And I've never been, I don't want to sound sanctimonious, because let's face it, all of us have used a little fib every now and then, but um, I've never been lied to so much in my life as happens in Guantanamo. It happens all the time by these nice, well-brought-up people whose mums and dads told them they shouldn't do that. And you know what the solution is? I've got the solution. It's James Bond. <laughs> it's that because it's a secret base and they're all now involved in incredibly important national security issues, someone's told them they're all James Bond. And you know, when James Bond went around and someone asked him, are you a secret agent? Nah, he wouldn't say that. He'd say, no, I work for international exports or whatever it was. Now, he called that a cover story. You and I might call it a lie. Um, and the problem in Guantanamo is that the, the soldiers have really been told that it's a danger, a threat to national security to tell the truth. One soldier told me, please don't ever use the word, no, I'm saying, please don't ever use the word detainee. I can't stand the word detainee because that's the word that the military uses because being detained is not as bad as being a prisoner. So the soldiers are required to use the word detainee. And one of the nice soldiers I was chatting to one day said, you know, we have to use, we're required to use the word detainee. We're not allowed to use the word 
And then he wouldn't say it, he said P R I S O N E R, <laughs> thereby illustrating that people from Alabama can spell. <laughs> um, and now I'm only being patronizing. But he's a really nice chap, actually, I shouldn't say that. And he told me that they would be punished if they used the word prisoner. He never said the word prisoner, he spelt it out each time. Um, because they would be punished if they used the word prisoner because people in the media would get the wrong impression about Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable stuff, it really is. Are you surprised about that? Wait for the mic or we'll torture you, you bastard. <laughs> am I surprised at that? I can repeat your question. I am surprised because I'm naive. Well, it's, it's an army though, isn't it? I mean, you know, those soldiers basically could be killed if they don't follow orders. I mean, I'm, I'm right. You know, I was watching, I mean, what astonishes me is the way every day lies of not just this government, uh, the American government, but this government too, can be just sort of accepted. I mean, I saw, there was a report on the radio that, about what was going on in Iraq, and it's obviously, you know, that America's losing and Britain's losing and all these troops being killed and whatever, and the, the, Amer the army spokesman said, um, it may look like that to you, but it's a question of how you look at things. You know, and that seems to me to be the thing. It's not, it's not some random kind of weird thing, isn't it? It's that, you know, there's a ruling elite that has power that, that public opinion is completely against. You know, this Iraq war was the biggest show of protest in the world against a war happening. You know, they know that. That's why Tony Blair's gone, really. Well, I just, I mean, I'm just... I'm no, just no, you can have a rant. You don't have to have a rant. I mean, I mean, I mean the question was, is that I'm just, you know, I'm, you sort of, you're sort of saying it, I mean, it's shocking and all this stuff, and it's quite funny as well, but you're saying it as if you're surprised that these people are trying to cover up for this lie. I mean... You know, no, no, I, I, let me take issue with you. They freedom. They don't need freedom, do they? They need freedom for capital. No, no, no. I disagree with you. I think that's a big mistake to think that. I mean, I, I, you know, people are, are... How many people here are commie pinko lefties? <laughs> yeah, well, you lot and me. You know, we're in great danger of being a bit hypocritical, I think, sometimes, when we persecute the people who we think are the right-wing fascist lunatics. And... And it's, 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 it's probably wrong, and I think it's probably misguided. Um, the vast majority of people involved in the mission of Guantanamo Bay utterly believe in that mission. And they're not lying, and they could pass a polygraph test on that. They really, really could. And, you know, I think we, we misjudge them when we think they're lying. The, the, the majority of these folk um, are telling the truth as they know it. And that is far more dangerous. Uh, you know, I think Tony Blair could pass a polygraph test on those things too. The danger with him is he's an idiot, it's not that he's a liar. And, um, you know, I have a rule, you know, when we would do capital cases, if you were dealing with a corrupt cop, it was easy. There's a solution. Do any capital case where you have a corrupt cop, anyone know the rule? The rule is you look for their soon-to-be ex-partner and you go talk to them. And you find out everything. I, I had this wonderful case, Sharif Kuzan, 16-year-old kid on death row in Louisiana. And he clearly didn't do it. We knew who did do it. There's a videotape of him playing basketball at the time of the crime, for Christ's sake. <laughs> so, the, you know, I was very interested because there was a Crime Stopper tip that said Sharif did it for money, for a reward, just like Guantanamo. And $10,500 for anyone who solved this crime. And the Crime Stopper tip said that Sharif Kuzan did it and he was 5 foot 3, 115 pounds. Well, I knew Sharif. He was 5 foot 11, 170 pounds. <laughs> And then I was looking through the, through the police reports, and there it said that his prior criminal arrest was for truancy, for not going to school, age 12, 5 foot 3, 115 pounds. And I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> so I went to see Detective Small's soon-to-be ex-wife, Regina. And we're talking about it, and I say, you know, did your husband call in the Crime Stopper tip? She said, how do you know that? Oh, you know, I, I, we have our means. And she said, yeah, yeah, let me tell you about it. Well, he had a little system where he would call in the Crime Stopper tip and, you know, give, you'd give a false name and get a, get a location and a number, go arrest the guy, bring him in, and then call in and get the, get the cash. And he used to do this a lot. She went on to say about how he had a penchant for collecting tropical goldfish, and he stole them when he would go on, uh, on searches of people's houses and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, that's easy. When you're dealing with Detective Small, it's actually quite easy to expose corrupt cops. What's much more difficult is when you're dealing with true believers, people who really, really believe what they're doing. And I had a real eye-opener one time in the case of Ryan Matthews, 17-year-old mentally disabled kid on death row from Jefferson Parish, uh, Louisiana. 
where um, when we got involved, my charity over there got involved in representing him, there was, um, uh, we heard rumors on the street that this other chap had done it, a guy called Rondell Love, and he was boasting that Ryan was his duck who had gone down for his murder. And so there was some DNA in the original trial that I hadn't done the trial, but there's DNA on the mask worn by the murderer and um, had been thrown out of the window in the getaway car and it didn't match Ryan. But that was easy for the prosecution to explain. You know, he had just borrowed it from some, some other sort of master of mayhem and worn it just for this crime. Well, we looked at the DNA results in that and I went and checked out this other guy, Rondell Love, who had been in the meantime charged with another homicide and there was DNA results there and it matched the mask. So it becomes fairly obvious who did the crime in the first place. We took it all to the DAs. We then encouraged them to do their own extra testing. They did six DNA tests. Uh, we now have five witnesses saying Rondell Love's confessed to the crime, six DNA tests saying that his DNA matches the DNA on the mask. DA wouldn't believe it, just would not believe it, because he's a prosecutor, and people choose to become prosecutors in a long-term prosecutorial system where you're a lifetime prosecutor when you're into prosecuting people. I would make a fantastic prosecutor because I'd believe everybody and no one would ever get convicted. Um, but people who, who are prosecutors tend to believe people are guilty and the last thing they're ever going to do is say, oh boy, did I make a mistake and put an innocent little 17-year-old child who is mentally disabled on death row. It just doesn't happen. I have never, ever had a prosecutor in all the cases we've exonerated admit they made a mistake. It just doesn't happen. And so the issue here is not that these people are all going around lying. I think in the vast majority of cases is they believe this bullshit. <coughs> and that's much more difficult to combat, actually. It's much harder. I mean, yeah, but that's enough. It's a kind of madness that they believe. Got it's madness. You, if you ever ask something without getting the mic, she's yeah. going to do you in, and I need to <laughs> warn you. Well, personally, I think Tony Blair is slightly mad. As long as this isn't on, on camera, I think, uh, I think it's prima facie evidence that you're psychotic if you vote for the Tories, but that's a... That's a <laughs> I said that once to an audience when my mother green. was in the audience. She's lovely, but she's voted Tory since 1642. <laughs> and uh, no, you know, I'm not going to get into that. That's a huge broad steps, and, you know, I think they think I'm mad, and that's fine. I don't care. Um, I, I, I'm a journalist, and I'm an American, um, and I, I'd like to take issue, I think, with what my friend here was implying, which is that that Americans are mostly stupid. But I do wonder, and I'd like, this is my question to you, where is the outrage? The information is there. I'm a journalist, and I work for, I mean, don't, this sounds a little strange, but for, for the, a regular American person, I would have to shoot myself if I actually thought they were all idiots. But where, the information is there. We have the news stories. There are good journalists who are working on these cases. Why isn't there more outrage? Why aren't we angrier? Why, why is this happening? When you say we, are you talking about us as Americans or people in general? Uh, I guess Americans and people. Because so, I think we need to be very careful. Can we agree that the British are fucking patronizing assholes? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so I think you and I should have a little bonding session and just abuse them for a minute. Because the truth is that it was very frustrating for us representing the prisoners in Guantanamo and elsewhere. Guantanamo, by the way, is a tiny part of the problem, and we can talk about that later. But, um, you know, for, for the first two and a half years of this, there wasn't a peep out of those Brits either. And, you know, the British national sport, as all of us know, is what? Sorry? Someone said it. Well, whinging. Yeah, I agree with that. It's whinging. <laughs> you know, there's a great thing about VA. You know, when the, when the engines stop on a British Airways plane, it carries on whining. It's <laughs> full of English people. But, the, um, but, you know, our national sports is actually bashing Americans, isn't it? It's easy, it's fun with George Bush in office, and anyone can get involved in it. But you know the fascinating thing about the British is that the British people, you know, complain about how stupid the Americans are about things. And then British politicians copy all the bad things. They never copy the good things. You know, student loans, the, the red letter law, 
um, the Scarlet Letter Law. There are all these, there are all these unbelievably silly ideas from America. The British copy at the drop of a hat, of a, of a, whatever, and they don't copy things like free speech, for example, or a constitution, or elections instead of having an appointed House of Lords. You know the insane things the British should copy from. You know they should copy from the Americans. So the first thing I'd say is let's not be too defensive about these British journalists. They were hopeless for ages and now they're just being pious <laughs> and they're still not helping us on the things that we really need. But in answer to your second question, I mean the second prong of your question, which is the sort of self-abusive aspect of it, about why we as Americans are unable to do it. You know, let, let's look back to 1942 and what we did to the Japanese. And we interned the Japanese because, you know, they're people with strange faces and they're the enemy who are trying to kill us all. And we interned them all. And, you know, as of 1992, I think, every member of the Supreme Court had finally got around to condemning the fact that they, the Supreme Court, had upheld the internment of all Japanese people during World War II. But it took them 50 years to do it. And, you know, actually, it's, I think we're moving very quickly in America. When you compare us to where we were five years ago, uh, the movement towards common sense has been quite dramatic. Now, you know, for my clients, it's far too slow. But, but, you know, I think we whine too much, quite frankly. Now, that's not to say that you, as an American journalist, don't have an enormous responsibility to do far more. And I think, so far, you've been hopeless, and you're going to have to <laughs> sign that, uh, that bit of paper. But we're moving quickly. And you know the most encouraging thing to me is this. Um, two things. Okay, over here we're going to have George Bush saying on television, as he said, we Americans don't torture, we don't take part in torture, I'm the President of the United States. Over here we're going to have my client Benyam Mohammed saying, well, actually I was flown on a CIA plane to Rabat in Morocco where for 18 months they took a razor blade to my penis. Now, you in the audience, put up your hand if you believe George Bush. Seriously. Now, put up your hand if you believe Benjamin Mohammed over George Bush. Put up your hand. Isn't that interesting that the most powerful person in the world is now considered less credible than someone he says is a terrorist and the worst of the worst person in the world? Now, what I think is so encouraging in a way is that, you know, us Kami Pinko liberals, um, we sued him back in 2002, We've kicked his ass, to, to uh, borrow the words of his father when talking about the first Iraq war. And he said he was going to go in and kick a little ass talking about Saddam Hussein, and I, I like that. Um, and, you know, I think that's very encouraging, and it illustrates a very important thing about America, which is that we have a constitution, which means we can kick his ass. Now, people in Britain don't, and you people who don't think you don't need one need to get a life. Because you do. And, uh, and, and I find that terribly encouraging. And it's always been true in the death penalty, that when someone wants to kill your client, you can just say no. And you can tell them, I'm sorry, you can't do that. We've got a constitution. Now piss off. And, you know, this is wonderfully encouraging. And it shows that however powerful someone is, if they're doing something unjust, you can stop that stuff. Now you better not say it before you got permission. There was a woman here, the three back, just... Near, near me. That's it. Hello. I um, represent an Indian newspaper, and I was just wondering, I mean, were you just being funny when you said that you're now actually, you've been appointed an American interrogator? Who's, did um, I say that? Yes, you did. <laughs> I think it was only for interrogators. You said yeah. that you were authorized by Donald Trump so, to begin <laughs> enhanced interrogation. No, 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 no. I was kidding. I was interrogating okay, her. Just like Paul says I was you. pretending. The, the other <laughs> The other question that I had was, I mean, we have the death penalty as well in India. How do you compare, perhaps, a developing economy like India with uh, the most um, um, advanced in the world? I mean, <laughs> do you remember what Gandhi said when asked a similar question? Um, yeah, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think of Western yes, civilization? It would be, nice it would be a good idea, yeah. The, um, I, I, I don't think, you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure I would... Um, divide the world into developing and non-developing countries when it comes to killing people. It's wrong no matter where you are. And, you know, when you look at America, America is fascinating, and I think it's incredibly unfortunate from our perspective as Americans that we do use the death penalty, because if there's one certainty in life, 
It's that when the history books are written, they're not going to say that electrocuting people was a cool idea any more than they're going to say that burning witches at the stake was a good idea. I mean, if anyone, people can't see that, they're insane, to use your words. So, you know, whether it be India, whether it be the fascinating case I was getting involved in yesterday in Pakistan, where this British guy's got the death penalty for blasphemy, which I bet gets all of you people. Um, you know, how many people, well, no, I better not say that. It's probably on tape and we'll all get done. But, you know, there are those extreme examples. But in America, we got lots of examples. I mean, in the, the, I've represented 300 people on death row in America. And what kept me going was everything was so bizarre. And everything was so extraordinary. Um, and, well, I don't know where to start telling so many of the stories, actually. They're just so fascinating. But I'll give you an illustration. It's not about India, it's about judgment. It's ju about judgmentalism. Um, and we're all guilty of it. We shouldn't be too sanctimonious about this. But I've got a guy who I represent in Mississippi, a guy called Brian Kohlberg, who was sentenced to death in 1989 for something that just didn't happen. Um, and, and the facts of the case are this, that Brian was babysitting his girlfriend's two-year-old, 20-month uh, child, and uh, he had no history of any abusive things whatsoever. According to, he was sitting watching television and the kid was in the room next door on a bed that was three foot six high. And he didn't see this, but best guess was the kid stood up on the bed, toppled off, fell off, hit a hardwood floor just like this on the head. And uh, he didn't realize there was anything gone terribly wrong, put her back to bed, but then discovered that when he went to wake her up, a little while later that she was, uh, that had, had real problems, rushed her to the hospital and she ended up dying. Now, uh, that's his story. No one has ever impeached it in the least. Five American neurosurgeons testified at his trial, or doctors of different degrees, saying that it is physically impossible for a child's head to fall five feet and sustain a fatal head injury. Now, so put up your hand if you believe it's physically impossible for a child to fall five feet and sustain a fatal head injury. Put your hand up. I mean, that's really silly, right? I mean, you know, I was a physicist in an earlier life, and it doesn't take a great deal of mathematical ability to work out that that child's head would hit the floor at roughly 14 miles an hour. Um, madam, what's the fastest you can run? <laughs> very, very slow. How many miles per hour? How many miles per hour? A quarter of a mile now. <laughs> Who's going to put your hand up if you think you can run more than 15 miles an hour? Put your hand up. Come on. Oh, come on. Oh, here we go. You really do? Yeah. yeah you're deluded. You know, the, the, the fastest human being on earth can sprint 21 miles an hour. And so with each of these, when I did the retrial of, of Brown's case, I invited each of these neurologists to sprint as fast as they could into a brick wall and see what happened to them. And I couldn't get any of them to do it, you know. <laughs> but they still swore up and down. Are you volunteering to do it? There's a hand back there. They still swore up and down that it's physically impossible for that to happen. The challenge for us as a society is not to pick on the Indians and say, oh, that's third world. We, you know, the challenge is for us to recognize the flat earth society things that we believe. The American Medical Association says uniformly that it's impossible to die from a five-foot fall if you're an infant. Uniformly, I tracked down the only two doctors in the whole goddamn continent who were willing to testify for us that, 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 that that's not true. And there are lots of these things. There's, there's scientific bullshit that people get into where they condemn people to death based on nonsense is across the world. And, and I don't like to pick on different countries. I think we should just look at ourselves and look at the issues in our society that are ludicrous. And that's why all of you, no matter who you are, you've got something to offer. Because you may be a doctor, and you can come and testify for us, for Christ's sake. Or a physicist. Uh, there was a man at the back, right at the back on the right there. Um, Clive, I'm the um, legendary civilian spokesman in Afghanistan at the moment. I'm on a break in, uh, in the UK. And uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm discovering that I'm not in perhaps my most favoured company. Oh, yeah. But my question to you, um, having I work on a daily basis with Americans who I um, see are committed 
Um, my question to you is, if not Guantanamo, what mm -hmm. for some very bad people? That's a good question. It presupposes something that we've got to sort out, right? And the question is, are they bad people? And the reason my book's called Bad Men is because in a press conference with Tony Blair, um, old George was asked, yeah, you know, what about these people in Guantanamo Bay? And his response was, well, I don't know a lot about them, but there's one thing I can tell you, and that is they're all bad people. Well, that's bullshit, right? You know, and for 200 years in America, no, of course, I understand, I'm, but I'm going to answer your question, and I, and I don't mean to disparage what you say at all, because it's an important point. But um, for 200 years in America, 217 years in fact, and for about 1,000 years in Britain, we've had a system for sorting out who did it and who didn't, and it's called a trial. And you know, these people who have this mythological notion that somehow we face a new, totally different threat in our society, you've obviously never read a history book. Because I ask you, do you honestly, honestly think that our society is more threatened today by these lunatics who want to blow up um, the World Trade Center or whatever than when Adolf Hitler wanted to annihilate everybody or when during the Cold War we were going to blow up the whole world with nuclear weapons. It's just stupid to say, as George Bush says, that, and Tony Blair says, that this is somehow a brave new world, that we've got to have new reasons, new ways to deal with it. And so, for example, if you've got classified evidence, we've dealt with that for years. We had Soviet spies who were sworn to destroy our society, and we had trials. And if there were secret things that really were a threat to national security, which most things aren't, certainly hunger strikes aren't, then we'd have a, a closed session of that trial. Now, the problem is this. Let's get away from the negativity and let's talk about the positive thing. The problem with Guantanamo, as with the death penalty, is not, you know, you know when, you, when you talk about the death penalty and people say, why is the death penalty wrong? I'm really not interested. I'm really not. Uh, the question is, why is it right? What does it achieve? I have watched six people die and it's always at midnight and that's because we're vaguely ashamed. And when each time when I've watched some guy die, two in the gas chamber, two in the electric chair, and two in, the, in the, the, the gurney, you come out and you look up at the stars and you say, well, why is the world a better place? Because we just did that. Now, Guantanamo is a slightly starker example because there was a CIA agent who said to a friend of mine three years ago that for every prisoner we've held in Guantanamo Bay, we have inspired 10 people to want to blow us up. Now, Three years on, he would revise that, and he would say a hundred or a thousand. And the problem with our leaders is they don't understand what their job is. Their job is not to watch minority reports and see Tom Cruise trying to project <laughs> who in the future might commit a crime and create a bunch of stupid laws to try and stop that that just piss everyone off. The job of a politician is to make the world a safer place and to make your society a safer place. And it is just so blindingly obvious that Guantanamo Bay has made the world a much more dangerous place. Now, the greatest anti-terrorism weapon in our arsenal is the rigorous uh, enforcement of human rights. And it's obvious, right? Because if we stand up for what we're all about, and when I say we, I mean Americans and British people, and lots of other people for that matter, but we're talking about us for a minute, Norwegians too, because I know you're from Norway. Um, we're about decency. And you know, if we behave decently, there's vastly fewer people who want to kill us, and there are vastly more people who want to help us. And so you take this issue of a 90-day detention period. Oh, come on. I mean, it's just such a stupid idea. The Americans, for example, under our constitution in America, the maximum time we can hold someone in America, as opposed to in Guantanamo, without charging them, is 48 hours, not 48 days or 90 days, it's 48 hours. And the American democracy has not crumbled because of that. It may have crumbled because of George Bush, but not that. And you know, the idea that 90 days is somehow gonna make the world a safer place is just wrong. What it does do is it aggravates a lot of people and it creates people who view us as hypocrites and therefore you know, get angry. That doesn't excuse the crazy things they do, but it does help explain them. And so what we need to do is stop being so negative and let's start talking positively and let's start talking about how we can behave decently. I'm, I'm always amused if I could just say to you, sir, back there, 
the British um, are banging on these days about hearts and minds. I mean, they're always going on about hearts and minds, apparently because they've never read a book about Vietnam. And, you know, that was our mantra in America, hearts and minds. What a disaster that was. It's a great idea, but a very bad slogan, and we need a new slogan. Just like you can't use the word socialism anymore. It's a great idea, but you've got to use a different word. And we, in Britain and America, have got to stop talking about hearts and minds, and we've got to start talking <laughs> about some other euphemism that means the same thing. But we've got to talk about decency, and we've got to talk about, being, about living up to our ideals. And then we won't make the world a utopia, but we'll make it a much safer and better place. There's a guy down here in the second row, mm -hmm. and then after that, maybe take it the guy in the uh, back with the glasses. Okay, so presumably um, politicians uh, are clever enough to realise that Guantanamo and 90 day detention is, is not going to stop terrorism. So is your conclusion that they don't care about terrorism or is it that, that they're, they're stupid? No, no, no. I, I, think, I think this. I think this. You know, my wife has this wonderful Australian phrase and she says that politicians and judges never have delivered to them the long brown envelope of home truths. And I love that phrase. You know, M delivers to me the long brown envelope of home truths quite routinely, <laughs> and for very good reasons. But no, I don't think so. I don't think they're, well, I, actually, when I say I don't think they're stupid, I think they are monumentally unqualified for the job. And one thing that we in Britain should learn from America is the notion that there are three parts of government. It's not just the legislature and the judiciary, there's the executive. And the American system, there's a great play coming on, if I can tout this, Eric Schlosser has done a play that's going to be at the Globe on the 2nd of September for a while about the U.S. Constitutional Convention. The U.S. Constitution is a fantastic document, 217 years ago, better than anything we've come up with since. And, you know, in it, it identifies a way of running a government. And the, 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 the theory is fantastic. The practice sometimes lets us down a little. But um, the executive is the way you run the government. And if you're in the cabinet in America, unlike Britain, you cannot be an elected official. The idea of the cabinet is you handpick someone who really knows how to run the business for whatever aspect of government it is. Now, every now and then, we handpick Donald Rumsfeld. And, you know, whatever. I'm not defending that. But... But as a concept, it's a great concept. And when you think about Britain and how our politicians bang on about how we've got to privatize things because we've got to get experts in the job, the one job they don't do that in is the most difficult job, hmm. which is running a country. And let me say, if I was running the country, I would fuck it up. I don't mean to be pious about this. But take John Reed, who is um, someone I like to be a little obnoxious about. <laughs> In a little over two years, he held three cabinet positions, Secretary of Health, Secretary of Defense, Home Secretary. His qualifications for Secretary of Health were best summed up by his response when given the job, oh, fuck, not health. <laughs> now, why do we have those people running those jobs? It's insanity. You don't want that. So yes, in some ways, they're, 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 they're hopeless at those jobs. And we've got to look at the structure of our society to make it work. But we've got to look at it positively. And, you know, I don't think they're idiots. I just think they're utterly unqualified for the job, much as I would be utterly unqualified for most jobs myself. Um, so, so, you know, having said that, they really don't know what they're doing. When John Reed talks about running the Home Office, he has no idea what he's talking about. This is a guy who just wafted in there a few months before and now is telling us how to run a process that, you know, some of us have been working in for a lifetime. And he has no idea what he's doing. Now, is he sitting there saying, how am I going to be evil today? No, he's just achieving it. He's not <laughs> trying to do that. He doesn't know what he's doing. And, and what we've got to do is we've got to be more positive about structuring that and about structuring a system that works. And, and you know, I'm in favor of, uh, of taking the good things from America and copying them. I gave a little rant about that last year at the Longford Lecture, and I think we should do that. And we should stop whining so much, and we should say, how can we make this work better? The guy at the back in a black t-shirt with blonde hair. Um, my name is Tim Mansell, I'm a broadcast journalist. Given the sort of obvious injustice of Brad Tom, I suspect everybody in this room at Sachs, how many of these guys actually are people we really should be worried about? It's a good question. I mean, you know, when I went down to Guantanamo, I thought, uh, there's going to be a lot of people. Um, 
it was actually very difficult to find people who genuinely had done a whole lot. And now today, we know, since September the 6th, 2006, when Bush moved the 14 big-name people to Guantanamo, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi Bin Al-Sheed, Abu Zubaydah, people like that, um, it would take a pretty effective defense lawyer to deny that uh, KSM has done some horrible, horrible crimes. Um, you know, what you have to remember about someone like KSM was he boasted about it on Al Jazeera. So the idea that we have to torture him to get evidence to prosecute him <laughs> is, you know, I mean, you know, that's really important to me. I've been keeping a dossier on all of those people because my office is involved, one of our projects is tracking down the missing prisoners. And he was obviously one of them for many, many years. So we kept a dossier on him and the intelligence on him was enormous. And we could prosecute that guy easily for all sorts of terrible things. You just play that videotape to any jury in America and he not only gets convicted, but he gets the chop. Now, it's a different game. Now that we've screwed things up so badly by torturing him, prosecuting him becomes a vastly more difficult job. So there are some people in Guantanamo, a, a small number, quite frankly, a small number. And, you know, uh, the best example of how wrong we as Americans get it is, is Ahmed Erachidi. Ahmed is a client of mine who uh, the U.S. military determined was the general of Al-Qaeda. And he was the leader of the Al-Qaeda military wing, wing in Guantanamo Bay. And if that's true, let's face it, he's a bad dude and we've got to do something about him. And you'd all agree with that, right? The question is, how do we assess whether that's true and are we right? Well, <laughs> um, you know, for a long time, he insisted to them that he was a chef and he came from London. But because he didn't have a lawyer or anything like legal rights, they said, no, 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 you're the general of Al-Qaeda. They said that in the press, by the way, and you people published it. Um, but, you people, look at that wonderful prejudice. I don't mean that. Of course you did, but you've got to be really wary about this stuff. Uh, it's just fascinating to me how journalists publish any crap that comes out of the DOD, but then says, when I say to him, well, actually, this guy's been horribly tortured, they say, can you corroborate it? I mean, it's really bizarre. But with, um, with, with Ahmed Arachidi, I first got in to see him in April 2005. And he said the same thing to me. He says, you know, they say I'm the general of Al-Qaeda, you know. I am the cook who became the general. The crack of an egg became the explosion of a bomb, were his words. He's a wonderful guy. Um, and he said, you know, really, when they say I was in the Haldan training camp in July 2001, I wasn't. I was cooking eggs at the Westbury Hotel. <laughs> and I told them that, but they won't believe me. And they say I'm the general. And, you know, I think I know why they say that. You know, I'm bipolar. I'm manic depressive. I was sectioned in England because I'd had a breakdown when my dad died, and I had another breakdown here in, uh, in Guantanamo. I can't tell you exactly. I don't remember what I said, but my friends tell me that when they asked me, are you a friend of bin Laden's, are you one of his lieutenants, I said, no, I'm his general. I'm in charge of him. <laughs> and apparently he also said, written down in a little green book that the Americans were keeping, he said, uh, and by the way, there's a very large snowball that's about to envelop the earth and kill you all. Um, you know, you, one laughs, but this guy had been held as the general of Al-Qaeda, and the reason he was, was because he lived in Britain for 18 years as a cook. He's from Morocco originally. He speaks English very, very fluently and very loudly. And when he thought there was something unjust, he would let people know. And so he naturally, uh, the Americans assumed, as you know, a minority of people who spoke English, he became the interlocutor for the other people. The reason the British residents and nationals are considered to be particularly wicked is because they're the interface between the American soldiers and the prisoners because they speak English. And this is the bottom line of, of him. Um, so when he finally got a lawyer, you know, I was set about trying to prove what he said was true. And actually, one of his witnesses should have been John Reed, because they had his passport at the time he was meant to have been in Pakistan. And indeed, he was cooking eggs in the Westbury Hotel, and then he went on to cook eggs somewhere else. And this is a guy who they really thought was the general of Al-Qaeda. He's now free. I got to go down to, to, to Tangier um, two months ago and stay with him in his house, because in, in a rare instance, the US military recognized they'd made a huge mistake. And this guy, who is such a wicked guy, is now with his wife and two children in Tangier. Guantanamo is just a, a piece of marketing, or rather, people yeah. in Guantanamo, who we, as I say, we should be really worried about, and we really do 
They, no, I've, I've, said, I've, I've said that there are some people that way. I think it's a small number, but there are some people that way. But the only way we can really assess it is if we have a trial and give both sides the chance to litigate it. I mean, you just can't assess it by letting the military say it's true and saying no one else can dispute it. But to follow up on what you said, if I may, f the one thing I meant to follow up on was this. 365 people in Guantanamo Bay. According to the congressional record, August the 25th, 2006, 14,000 prisoners in secret detention by the United States. So that means 97.3% of the secret prisoners, the ghost prisoners, are not in Guantanamo. Mm. And Guantanamo is and always has been a diversion in this whole war of terror, as Borat calls it. Um, and so, you know, what we've got to get away from is Guantanamo. That's, you know, even, I mean, look, of, of the 14 big name people, the interesting story there is not who was taken to Guantanamo, but for you journalists, it's who wasn't taken to Guantanamo. Where, pray, is Sheikh al-Libi. And you all know Sheikh al-Libi was the guy who was the first big name seized by the U.S. in al-Qaeda, was rendered to Egypt, was tortured, everyone knows that now, confessed that indeed al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein ha were working on weapons of mass destruction. Um, that was quoted October the 22nd, 2002 by George Bush, quoted again by Colin Powell in the UN as a reason to go to war. We all know it's not true. Why is he not in Guantanamo Bay? Now you know the answer to that. It is too embarrassing. And there's a lot of husks of human beings. Where do you think Sheikh al-Libi is today? I can tell you, by the way, but where do you think he is? <coughs> Sorry? No, no, he's in Libya, of course. What we do with the people we want to get rid of is we send them to the uh, nutcase dictators who we now say are civilized human beings, and he will never, ever see a journalist to tell his very embarrassing story about why the Iraq war happened. There's a lot of people like that. We've got a list of them. And you guys need to do, do some investigation on that. I say that only so I can take credit for what you come up with <laughs> and publish it separately in one of my reports. Uh, there's a man over there by the window holding a pencil up. Haha, <laughs> we're training him. No, Mike. We beat the shit out of you. <laughs> uh, Geneva Convention, um, given that third convention doesn't specify it shall apply to all persons unilaterally, but lists as set members those in Article 3, which um, set members are, are not featured in Article 3? Whom does it not apply to? Well, of course, it doesn't apply to anyone, right? Um, because, you know, one of the interesting things about the law is that if there's no forum in which to assert and enforce your rights, you don't have a right. Now, someone put your hand up and name for me one international convention that the U.S. has signed that's enforceable in any court anywhere in the world. Put your hand up if you know one. There isn't one. You're quite right. I was interested to see who would put their hand up. Um, there's none. So the problem is the Geneva Convention is not enforceable in any court in the world. The, the, the ICCPR is not enforceable because we haven't signed it. The um, Convention Against Torture is not enforceable because it's not enforceable in any court. So, and so on and so forth. It was, up until last year, there was one. And I could have told you the Vienna Con Convention on Consular Relations was indeed enforceable in a, in a court, but it's not anymore because we've withdrawn from that. So now there is no international human rights covenant that's enforceable anywhere. Now, the US Constitution is enforceable. For who? Americans. If you're not part of our little constitutional agreement, you know, you don't have any rights. So the problem is this, that, you know, we can argue, you know, lawyers do argue, I think it's an unbelievable waste of time, <laughs> uh, about, you know, what these different laws mean and how they're enforceable. None of them are enforceable, except in the court of public opinion. And I'll give you an example of the, uh, of the Geneva Conventions, which is close to any British person's heart, and it involves gardening. Um, you know, who would recognize among you British people that actually most of our British uh, uh, fellow citizens are far more concerned with gardening than they are with human rights? Put your hand up if you agree with that. Accept that as a truth. Um, the, uh, we had a little project because actually right there in the Geneva Conventions it says you have a right to have a garden if you're a POW. 
And so the Rumsfeld was banging on about what a great place and we're consistent with the Geneva Conventions, this, that, and the other. So at Reprieve, we did a little thing where we encouraged British people to send seeds <laughs> and gardening advice for prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. Now, we got deluged with this stuff. I was longing for someone to invite me onto Gardener's World and so we could discuss it. And, you know, I sent all of those seeds on to Donald Rumsfeld, and we had a big thing about how, you know, you say you're consistent with the Geneva Conventions, let our prisoners grow tomatoes. And they did. They, they, they caved. They caved. There is now in Camp 4 in Guantanamo Bay a garden. And, you know, the bottom line of the, the, there is no limit to which you as people, and certainly you as media people, can't win in the court of public opinion. Throw this bullshit out about the courts. But take torture. What, what way can you win in torture? You can't sue them anywhere in any American court, but I'll tell you what you can do. Uh, Binyam Mohammed taught me this. Um, when, after they'd finished taking the razor blade to his penis, they started playing that awful music to him. You know, 24 hours a day, full volume, all the time. And we were sitting there talking, and it occurred to me to ask him what the music was. And, and Binyam, you know, lived in Kensington. You know, he's a very sophisticated guy, and he could, of course, because he listened to it 24 hours a day, he could recite the whole damn album to you. And uh, they were playing Eminem, White City. And one's natural response when you learn that is to go look up the lyrics. I'm always intrigued by that. And, and one of the lyrics of White City is, uh, I want to fuck the vice president's wife, which is surely not the message we should be giving to Harris. <laughs> Um, you know, and I don't want to say anything snide about uh, Dick Cheney's wife, but, um, but anyway, it just amused me. And it also made me think, if you're going to torture me, it's country western music, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, that gives you an entree, right? Because even though human rights conventions aren't enforceable, um, actually, copyright is. And so, <laughs> so I contacted, I, tr I tried to contact Eminem's agent to get him to agree to let us sue. Because wouldn't that be fun? You know, we get to see Donald Rumsfeld. Every time they play that song, they've got to pay royalties. <laughs> and uh, what's more, on deposition, they've got to explain why they didn't use country western music, which is what I really want to know. And also, Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen and the theme tune of Barney, that awful television program. So, you know, these are the sorts of ways we're going to get them. We're not going to get them, you know, I don't expect Rumsfeld to serve life imprisonment. And, and quite honestly, I don't want him to. Um, but we've got to stop this bullshit one way or the other. And, and the ways you do it is generally by, um, by laughing at him. You know, the truth is, George Bush doesn't care if you hate him, because that reinforces his sense of self, because you're a communist. But he doesn't like it if you, uh, if you laugh at him. So you've got to come up with great ways of doing that. I've got lots of ideas, but I'd like to hear yours. Uh, there's a woman just behind you there. Um, I want to ask about the detainees who had um, indefinite leave to remain in the UK. I think one of them is Samuel Tayyus, the Libyan. And mm -hmm. I think just only recently that the government, the UK government, has finally decided to do something about their situation. Is it that their situation is going to be rectified, especially in the case of Burma, because he lost his indefinite leave to remain? Is the government trying to find a way to repatriate them and give them legal status in the UK? Or are you concerned that they might be returned to their home countries? And I guess in Omar's case, in Libya, he might face um, torture, even execution. I think the use of the word might is uh, dubious in that circumstances. Would is a better word. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, the five British residents, and there are actually eight British residents, and we can talk about why the other three supposedly aren't British residents, because I was meeting with the Foreign Office on that this afternoon. Um, but. The five British residents are finally going to come home, assuming the Americans let them. And those are Omar de Gaius. They're, they're, we, my charity represents them all. And Omar is a Libyan refugee. Uh, Jamil Albana, a Jordanian refugee with five little British children here in London, one of whom he's never met because the child was born after he was grabbed in the Gambia. Uh, there's Shakarama, four little British children here in London, one of whom he's never met, born after he was uh, spirited away from Pakistan. And then Binyam Mohammed, razor blade to the genitalia, and then a guy called um, Ahmed um, Abdinur Samir. You know, the real question is why the British government hasn't intervened for them long before. 
because, you know, while I'm a British citizen, I've spent far less time in this country in the last 20 years than Omar de Gaia's has. And I have far fewer claims that the British government should support me and my family than Jamil with five little British children and the British wife does. Um, so, you know, we really wonder why they haven't done that before. And there's an answer. And the answer, of course, is that John Reed and uh, Tony Blair are nutcases. And, you know, the, the, the thing that this current government is not doing is taking credit for a serious U-turn. And people criticize U-turns, but if you're driving in the wrong direction, you should do a U-turn, or at least use a roundabout. And, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing, but they're not willing to accept that they've made a big change because they don't want to trash, you know, their previous people. But they're doing the right thing, and we should congratulate them. Um, but Omar de Gais represents a very good example. Omar's dad was murdered, having been tortured, by the mad dog of Tripoli um, back in 1980. Amnesty International intervened on his behalf too late. They finally escaped that country, came to this country in 1987, lived in Brighton, one of your neighbors, and, um, and Omar studied law, lived here forever, supported Brighton FC, which is the only strike against him. <laughs> and, uh, and he was studying law, and he hadn't qualified yet, but he was trying to. I tried to get his law books in so he could study in Guantanamo, but they were censored because, you know, that legal stuff is a bit of a threat to national security. <laughs> oh, by the way, thinking of censored books, we had so much fun, a little tangent. I had a game where I was getting authors to give me their books signed for my clients to see if I could get them into the clients. So, for example, um, let's see, well, of course, one that wasn't going to get in was uh, George Galloway's book about, uh, <laughs> and he signed it, Maximum Respect Omar. Um, that was to Omar de Guise. I also had one from John Kampfner of The New Statesman. The only one, interestingly, that got in, which uh, was The English by uh, Jeremy Paxman. And I was uh, whoring it up on Newsnight one night, and I was trying to kiss up to old Paxman so he'd treat me well on, on Omar de Guise's case. And so I was sort of groveling and saying, you know, last time I went to see Omar de Guise, I looked in his cell, and there were only two books in there. And one was The Holy Quran, and the other was uh, The English by Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> Peter Marshall said, oh, so it's true, they do torture the prisoners. <laughs> Um, but anyway, to get back to, your, to, to the point, Omar, you know, all of these guys are British residents. Human rights are actually for human beings, not for British citizens. And, uh, and if we want to do ourselves some good in Britain, the first thing we'd do to make the world see us standing up for human rights is what we used to do, which is recognize people who are being persecuted by despotic lunatics around the world and protect them. And I can guarantee you that um, the prisoners, those five prisoners, when they come back to Britain, will give no trouble to anyone. Uh, you know, what's bizarre about that whole process is the Americans are begging other countries now to take prisoners because they've got to close Guantanamo Bay. And so the Department of State was behaving very well. I got a free lunch out of them where they were talking to me about how we could help persuade the British to take these guys. And they're doing the right thing, and I don't mean to criticize them at all. The moment the British agree to do that, the Department of Defense goes up and because they're not willing to say they've ever made a mistake. They say, these people are very dangerous in the Sunday Times this weekend. You know, telling the British people and the British government, you shouldn't take them. I mean, they're insane. And Jamil Albana was one. They say he's very dangerous. They just cleared him. Um, the guys, they say he's a um, Bosnian jihadist. Well, that's news to me. Last time they said he was a Chechen jihadist. <laughs> and uh, they had a video of it. And we finally got the video on Newsnight, played it on Newsnight. It wasn't him, of course. And uh, I could tell him it wasn't him, because I know him. But uh, we got a little support. How many people have paid their TV license? Put your hand up. Yeah, well, you don't know. I didn't know this. Part of your TV license goes to fund a guy with the MI5, who's half funded by MI5, half by the BBC, to watch television. And <laughs> they watch TV, and any, any perfidious terrorist they see, they write a report on it. This guy called up after watching Newsnight to say, that's not Omar de Guise. I'll tell you who it is. It's Abu Walid, who, unsurprisingly, is a Chechen terrorist. But he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so now the Americans say he's a, you know, that Omar's a Bosnian terrorist. I mean, it's just stunning. And this is more of this lying bullshit. But, you know, Britain should do more than that. If you wanted to do the best thing as British Prime Minister you could do to protect the British people, you'd say, all right, we'll take all of these people from Guantanamo. 
you know, and I can guarantee you uh, that you wouldn't have too much trouble out of them, but it would send such a message to the, the, the world of Islam that actually we stand up for what we say we stand up for, that it would mean there wouldn't be another bomb go off in Britain forever. It's not going to happen, because our politicians are never going to accept what the Sun would publish about that, but it would be a sensible thing to do. Uh, but, you know, I think I've got off track on your question, but these five people, are, uh, it's wonderful they're coming home. They're not coming home yet, but they will come home. That's great. What about the other three? Well, the other three, uh, for example, Ahmed um, Belbacher, who's one of our clients who lived in Bournemouth, who um, was working in a hotel in Bournemouth and was cleaning um, Mr. Prescott's room during the Labour Party conference in 2000. And John Prescott gave him a big tip and wrote him a nice letter saying he did a really nice job on my room. Well, the British government say that he didn't legally come into this country. Well, he fled Algeria, and whether he legally came in here or not, he applied for asylum, and he was totally open about it, and he worked very hard in this country, and now they want the Americans have cleared him of being a terrorist, and they are trying to send him back to Algeria, where, which he fled. And he fled because actually both the government and the Islamic extremists, the GIA, had threatened to kill him. Um, just because he was in the army there for a while and he deserted the army because the GIA said they were going to kill his family. So he came to Britain to seek asylum because he thought Britain was a decent place that would give him asylum. Uh, and now we're not willing to take him back. And the Americans announced they were going to, well, we got leaked to us that they were going to take him back last Monday. And we tried to get that stayed by the U.S. Supreme Court, and we did get it stopped for a week. But just the day before yesterday, the U.S. Supreme Court denied a stay, saying, uh, in effect, there's no court in America willing to listen to his case. And he's going to go back to Algeria and get killed unless someone steps up to the plate for him. And why the British government won't, even if they say he illegally came into the country, so what? You know, this is a guy who's a, who's a refugee. And... Um, you know, it's a great shame they won't. And there are two other guys, too, um, who, who are in similar circumstances, both from Algeria. Uh, and these are just the people who were British residents. I mean, I think we should take the others, but we should certainly take them. Well, the guy uh, just behind you on the right-hand side, blonde. Um, presumably, the other group that um, have visited Guantanamo is the International Red Cross. What have they done there? What do you think of their work and, and how have the Americans uh, received them? Well, you know, I don't know if, you know if you're affiliated with the Red Cross at all. And of course, they do great stuff. But, you know, you've got to think about some of these things that I never thought about. I mean, why are they called the Red Cross, for Christ's sake? Um, you know, this is a thing that alienates all the prisoners in Guantanamo because they're all Muslims. And even though you may pretend that that's the Red Cross of the, of the Swiss flag, the reason it's a cross is because it's a cross. And, you know, unfortunately, the prisoners take the position, and I think this is a little unfair, but they do, and we need to recognize it, that the Red Cross is under this stricture where if I'm a prisoner and I say to the Red Cross, I've been tortured, the Red Cross isn't allowed to report that. And the prisoners say, well, what's the point of talking to these people? I tell them that I've been tortured, they're not allowed to do anything about it. And there are these very interesting issues that I don't pretend to be an expert in, but it's something that we should uh, debate. You know, the Red Cross is bound under its current rules to keep confidentiality. And that's the rules. And they say that's the rules, and of course it is the rules. But the question is, why is that the rules? Why is it that we as an international society have agreed that if we're going to go see prisoners in POW camps around the world, that one of the things we have to agree to in order to have that privilege is that we're not allowed to tell about crimes that are happening in front of our very eyes. And there's a lot of Red Cross people who I would never snitch on, but they've been very good, and they've leaked stuff, of course. Um, and I think that's admirable, but they're probably not meant to do it under the rules. Um, and by the way, I've got no evidence of that, and I'm not a witness for you people. But, but I, I think that what they're trying to do is their mission is great. Unfortunately, some of the strictures under which they do it uh, make it very difficult for prisoners to trust them and very difficult for them to achieve anything. Uh, and I think we need to revisit all of that and, and consider whether that's the way we should structure it, whether we should have a convention that says, hey, the red whatever it is should be allowed to visit people under whatever circumstances they like, and if they come across a crime, they're not only allowed to report it, they're duty-bound to report it. Why not? How can anyone in a world that calls itself civilized say that the rule is you can't come in unless you keep secret about crime? You, it's a negotiating stage, and 
In the case, sorry, of Guantanamo, they've actually switched uh, uh, no, on Russia. Repeat the question. It's, it's a good point. It's a good point, but it's related to cannibalism, I'll warn you. <laughs> hmm. Well, well, basically, the reason why they use confidentiality is because that way they gain the trust to access this count and many, many other places that nobody else can access. But they use the confidentiality to negotiate with governments, usually. And if that doesn't work, we eventually speak out. And in, in the case of Guantanamo, they have speak out as well now. And that's one of the first times that they, I mean, the few times that they have. Now you say that, you say there is confidentiality, and that's the law, but there was cannibalism, and that was the, the way it went, you know, we ate human beings. You know, it wasn't a good idea, and we had to change that, and, and we should change this. Um, because, look, think about, let's, have, let's say you had a, a conference about whether the Red Cross should be allowed to speak out about crimes. Who's going to argue they shouldn't? I want to hear them, I'd love to hear them say publicly, we Americans think that if the Red Cross comes across a crime, they shouldn't be allowed to mention it. That's ridiculous. And yet that is the law. You're quite right. It is the, it is the rule, but it's absurd. And what we have to do is, uh, is, is self-proclaimed sane human beings, not necessarily, is change those rules. And, and I agree with you that's the way it is, but it's wrong. It's stupid. Should, should we have a one... Uh so one last question, because we've got to we've got to wind up. The, the guy in the white uh, jacket, right at the back, is has his hand up all the time. Okay, uh, you only mentioned the American uh, soldiers uh, uh, holding up the the constitution or not the constitution, the bullshit of the American army. What effect does it have when they go back to the civilian society? Well, you know, Mosin Beg. I hope some of you have read Mosin's book, Enemy Combatant. You know, Mason's a remarkable, remarkable guy. I have such admiration for him. Um, and, you know, he was treated horribly in those prisons. And, you know, he was tortured, and I don't care what George Bush said, he was tortured. Um, and, you know, some of the stories are great. One of the things he doesn't tell in this book, I think, was when I first went to see him, he told me all this stuff. One was a story about, you know, this poor soldier. In Camp Echo, the, the, the cells are divided down the middle. You sleep in this side, you're interrogated in this side. It's sort of hermetically sealed. Before they put cameras in there, the guards had to sit there 24 hours a day watching you. Unbelievably boring job. And the guards were filled up with all this nonsense. And Mosem is like five foot two, incredibly polite, really nice chap from England. And, um, so anyway, this woman comes in one day, and I think she's from Alabama or someplace, and she's sort of trembling like a leaf. And, uh, and finally, Mosem says, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know? And she's uh, a bit nervous, and she finally says, well, is it true? And he says, well, what's true? Is it true that you're a serial assassin? <laughs> and uh, Mosem laughs, and he says, what on earth are you talking about? And she says, oh, well, well, they told me that you are Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter. And if I get too close <laughs> to the wire, you're going to bite my face off somehow. Well, Mosin gave this poor woman therapy for the next three weeks, and they became friends. And, and she gave him a great credit to him, I think, and to her, that she gave him her email address and said, look me up when you get out of here. And he has. And Mosin has made friends with some of these soldiers who were part of the process of his torture. And, you know, you know, a lot of people only see what they're told. And unfortunately, it's a cycle of violence in Guantanamo because it is a violent place now. I mean, the, the only U.S. soldier who's seriously been injured in Guantanamo was a uh, specialist baker who was injured by his fellow American soldiers when he was pretending to be a... Uh, he was dressed up in orange and he was pretending to be a prisoner, and his superior officer hadn't told his mates that he wasn't a real prisoner. They beat the shit out of him, and he was meant to say red when things got out of control, and he said this in a loud Kentucky accent, and they carried on beating him up, and he ended up having brain damage. And he is the, he's the American soldier who's been the most injured in Guantanamo, contrary to what, uh, what Donald Rumsfeld has said. But nonetheless, there is a tangible sense of hostility in Guantanamo between the guards and the prisoners. And the reason for it is the guards are told the prisoners are dangerous, wicked, wicked people. The guards treat the prisoners terribly. The prisoners throw shit at them. And all sorts of terrible stuff goes on. And there's no trust 
at all between the two parties. So the majority of people, I think, finished their tour of duty in Guantanamo saying, oh, these guys are nasty bastards. But it's not true of everyone. I mean, they've, they've tried in recent months to absolutely forbid communication between the prisoners and the guards. But before that, there used to always be prisoners and guards, just like on death row. When you go to an execution, the guards are almost invariably against it. It's the fucking media who are going there thinking it's all some jolly thing. The guards don't want to do it because they've known this guy for years. And um, I don't mean that about all you media people. I'm just trying to get a rise out of you, of course. But it, it really is a problem. The guards normally establish a relationship with the people that they're, they're working with and come to like them and see them as human beings. Uh, you know, that happens in Guantanamo quite a lot. And, and in the old days, when I first went there, I used to get into these long conversations with the guards, and they would tell me all sorts of stuff. And it was fascinating, and I published it all. And uh, that's why they stopped it. And now the guards are absolutely forbidden from talking to us as lawyers. And we lawyers are the enemy. One of the guards told me, he'd been told, we are the enemy, we're the enemy of the mission, and they mustn't talk to us. And now they really don't. They don't talk a word to us, and they don't talk to the prisoners. And of course, that stops the capacity for all of us to see each other as human beings. And so there's much less of that today. And in fact, Guantanamo is a much more unpleasant place today than it was two and a half years ago. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. But, um, but you know, there are a lot of people who come out and, and tell some of the truths. Uh, let me give you the best example because of the sort of pejorative things I've said about persecutors. Three of, I've done one of those kangaroo court things in Guantanamo, it's tremendous fun. But three of the American military prosecutors who were handpicked for the job of prosecuting people in those military commissions had the courage to send emails to their superior officers saying they're not willing to do this because their colonel in charge had told them that the system was rigged and that they didn't have to worry about the evidence because all these guys were going to get convicted anyhow. And they said, you know, we're just not going to do that. That's unethical. Mm. We're just not going to do it. And they had the courage to resign over that. Now, of course, that was classified and it was kept secret for well over a year until someone leaked it to us and we published it. And it's had very little publicity, actually, but I think that shows amazing courage on behalf of people who were handpicked to be the prosecutors who will probably never, ever get promoted after saying something like that. The, the military lawyers who I've worked with defending these guys, fantastically courageous. And when they stand up in their uniforms, I brought, um, we had a press conference here in April 04, where Dan Morey, Major Dan Morey of the US Marine Corps came here. And I was trying to get Dan to wear his uniform where we did a press conference because I thought it looked cool and it would make him much more credible than people like me. And uh, actually, to begin with, he starts mouthing off about how wrong the whole process is. And he wouldn't wear his uniform because he said, no, this is me talking. This isn't the US Marine Corps. But the, his superiors got mad at him and said, you're a member of our military, and you're damn well going to wear your uniform when you're doing this. So then they made him wear his uniform. So we then did this press conference here in Westminster. And Dan was absolutely fantastic. He started doing cricket analogies, and he said, you know, Guantanamo Bay is a little like a cricket match where you let the bowler call LBW. And I just loved that. I thought it was great. I didn't put him up to it either. <laughs> and, um, and he's been incredibly um, courageous. He's been to Australia. He represented David Hicks. And he has changed single-handedly uh, Australian public opinion and has been absolutely fantastic. And, and you know, that's a tribute to the people who take part in the system. And it is a tribute ultimately to the American system that, uh, you know, Dan, he may never get promoted, but he hasn't been prosecuted. And, uh, and people are allowed to do that. And they're allowed to say what they really believe. I, I somewhat suspect it would be harder for a British military officer to stand up and, and say those sorts of things on television, criticizing their own military and what happened in Basra, for example. I don't know. Well, I've been told to, uh, to wind up. So thank you very much. Mm. It was a great evening. Mm. And uh, sure we could have listened all night. I guess we'll just have to right. buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. much.